hope you are doing well. I hope you are having a great evening. Welcome to the Brown Mama Blueprint Podcast. Make sure you invite your friends to join. Make sure you share the video. So tonight we are going to be talking with Dr. Jay Hughley. I'm going to invite him to come and join our conversation. And we are going to be talking about Black Pride. Yes, we are going to be talking about Black Pride. But not Black Pride for us, Black Pride for our beautiful brown babies. That is who we are. We're going to be talking with uh, Dr. James Hughley. So I'm going to go ahead and invite him, you guys. So just give me a second. This should be a lot easier this time around because we practiced. Yay! <laughs> we actually practiced this time. So it's actually adding him now. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you, everybody, for coming in. Thank you for watching Brown My Blueprint podcast. Podcast. There is Dr. J. Dr. J, thank you for coming in, for tuning in with us. How are you tonight? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming in. So, for those of you guys who don't know Dr. J, Dr. J is actually a doctor, and he is actually a professor over at the University of Pittsburgh, correct? Yeah, that's right. I'm at the um, School of Social Work in the Center on Race and Social Problems. Gotcha. And so how I first, I actually encountered Dr. J's work before I ever encountered him. I'd actually, because I run Pittsburgh Brown Mama, somebody over at the university had sent me his study that he did on, uh, basically the study is on, I'm losing my words here, as I've been doing all week for some reason, I've just been losing my words, but the study is on basically how we can instill black pride, racial pride in our children and the benefits of that and why it's important that we begin to accept that children do best in school, in academia, when they can see themselves in their education, when they can see themselves as important in society in general. So if you want to tell us a little bit about your study instead of me trying to quote you, <laughs> well, you're doing, why would you go ahead and do that, Dr. J? You're doing a great job. Um, so the work that we've been involved in here for a number of years has, uh, starting with my uh, one of my colleagues, Ming Tae Wong here, uh, we we have recognized for a long time, and, and I'm I'm sure your audience has recognized that for Black parents, we have a unique challenge in raising our children. So we have all the challenges that mainstream parents in the U.S. have. We uh, we want them to be good people. We want them to be high achievers. Uh, we want them to be successful in their careers. But we also have to help them uh, navigate a racialized society, one that where we see incidents like Trayvon Martin or even locally uh, Antoine Rose. Uh, we have to explain why when you look in our, our low-income communities, you see so many black and brown faces. And when you look in our affluent communities, you see so many white faces. Why, when you look on the media, especially the news media, you see so many negative images of our people, and these images are bombarding our children all the time. So what we have thought, and many others have thought as well, that you know, when, when black parents are helping their children process those negative images, helping their children understand what they're seeing, what they're experiencing also in society, that they may ben that may benefit their children, and at the same time, when they're promoting the the positive images and the positive information about their racial history, that also might have a positive effect. So the study that you're talking about is one that we did a few years back that looked to see how promoting racial pride and talking about uh, racial biases help children do better academically. And what we did find there is that over a period of time, parents who did more racial pride education with their children had higher achieving children. And they all, we also found that when that racial pride was combined with uh, preparing kids for racial bias, that the effect was even stronger. Lastly, uh, we also found in that study that Teaching your children about racial pride offsets the effect of discrimination on academic achievement. And we know that from the research, discrimination has a very negative impact on, on kids psychologically, academically, behaviorally. And we found that teaching race pride is one of the ways 
that we can help to offset those effects for the children. So we did find very good and positive effects for teaching on uh, racial pride in black families, and uh, we've been building on that research ever since. That's excellent. And your study really resounded me so much so that I used parts of it in Chapter 14 of my book, The Brown Mama Mindset. Okay. And there's a ch there is a chapter um, in the love section because I deal with loving yourself, loving your family, or excuse me, loving yourself, loving your mate, and loving your children. And so in the Brown Mama Mindset in Chapter 14, it's a chapter called Parenting the Black Way. And I actually used parts of your study because one of the things that I found with my children was once I decided to homeschool, history is really one of the only subjects they never fight back with me on. Because whenever they are learning about, like we did a study on the Black Panther Party, we did a study on the strategies of war utilized by, um, what's his name? Uh, the uh, the oh, Haitian, oh. Oh. To Toussaint, yes, the strategies Toussaint. of war utilized by Toussaint um, when he was trying to win freedom for the people of Haiti. And it's interesting because whenever I'm teaching them about their history, they have lots of questions. They're extremely excited to learn about it. They don't fight back in terms of, you know, we don't want to do this, or they find it, they're very intrigued by this information. So I've seen firsthand the effects of when you teach your children their history, when you teach your children that there are things, because of course, most of us, when we are in school, at least I know I had the experience of the only time we learned about any Black people that we should be proud of was during Black History Month. Any other time of the year that we were learning about African history was always, always from a very oppressive perspective. And so with my own children, I tried to make it so that we are learning about African history, not just, of course, during Black History Month, but also we are learning about the parts of our history that we should be proud of. And so I've definitely seen that, you know, I've definitely seen that the, the results of your study, I knew that they were true because I've already been experiencing that with my own children. But I know for a lot of, one of the hardest things for me when my kids were in school was realizing that even when I was doing work with them on the back end to make them proud of their history, to make them proud of who they were, a lot of times that work was being overridden when I was sending them to school. And not because the teachers or administrators were doing anything to decrease racial pride, but more so because it was a non-factor. Yeah. And they're spending more time at school than they're spending with us. So and what? how can we make that essentially what we need to find a way to do? Because most African-American parents are not homeschooling. So how can we find a way to make what we teach at home stick with our kids? and make it so that it's not being overwritten by the status quo of society, these images, these, you know, these places where basically being black is a non-factor. Yeah, that's, that's a really important question. And I think to start to answer that question, we have to think about why schools are resistant to history of black people, history of oppressed people. There are a number of reasons, but one of the things that I think happens is that they don't know it themselves. They don't know that it's important, and they actually believe yes. a lot of myths and untruths about the history of black people, the history of Native Americans and, and Latinos. And I'll give you an example. You know, I teach a class here at Pitt, uh, University of Pitt, called Race and Social Problems, and we basically go through the history of race in the United States and racial relations in the United States, racial oppression in the U.S., one of the things that I have to do in my class, and I always start with it, is, is African history and African civilizations before the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade. And what I find is that people really genuinely do not know that there were strong, civically well-organized, sophisticated, scientifically sophisticated, uh, diplomatically engaged African societies in West Africa, throughout the continent, prior to European engagement in the slave trade. And they, what that means is that they don't know that when you look at the disparities in the U.S., that there once was a history of, of you know, dominant, strong black societies. And I start with that because I need people to understand that 
when you look at our disenfranchised communities, you know, black communities here, that these were once whole uh, families. These were once whole communities. These were once whole societies. And something has gone wrong. And America has done something Absolutely. wrong. And so teachers are, you know, are in education and social work, uh, you know, in any of these fields, they need to first understand that something has happened to create the disparities that we see for blacks and Latinos in the U.S. When they understand that that is not the natural state of these people, that these people are, are, are just as capable and just as strong, then they'll have a curiosity as to what's gone wrong. When they understand that, then we can begin to say our curriculum in school needs to tell the whole truth for kids to really understand what has happened in the U.S. We need to have positive images of black families black leadership, black accomplishments, black civilizations. We need to push to have the AP courses have to cover African history, have to cover things before the slave trade, have to cover things that really paint a holistic picture of Native American society and really come to terms with the difficult history and reality of our country. And uh, what does that mean for us? We have to be advocates. We have to be out trying to be on the school board. We have to be out trying to be on committees. I myself have been on the um, the Woodland Hills uh, Youth Development uh, Committee for the school district, and I know that through that work in the committee, we made recommendations around showing us in the curriculum, showing us in the teaching staff, uh, change discipline policies. And we're actively working on that, and I know Pittsburgh is doing the same thing in the university, I mean, in the school district. So advocacy is, is critically important. Parents also, I think, have to, on their own, when we talk to parents, and we've interviewed many, many parents about these issues, they are independently going to school to do what we call racial advocacy. They have to go in and say, hey, my child had a racial incident, and, and they have to advocate for that, that child. And that's really important to try to change the school, but it's also important for that child. And what we find is that when children face racial incidents and about half of black kids say they face race, racism in school from teachers, the ones we talk to, the parent advocacy is key in helping them feel like they can sustain, helping them feel validated, and helping them to be resilient in the faces of racism. So you have to be an advocate on the systemic level have to be an advocate on the individual level. And I think we got to be strategic. We have to have, you know, groups like Brown Mamas that say, well, what is our agenda? What do we want to do to impact change? What are the districts that we're president? How are we going to advocate and make this happen? Absolutely. And I, I agree with that wholeheartedly because when my kids were in school, I was one of those parents who was really involved. And what I found was sometimes when kids, I remember my son's teacher and she was a really nice woman this was she was a white woman but she was a really nice woman and i could tell that she really cared about her kids but she would do something every morning that irked the mess out of me or at least every morning that i was there which i was only there once a week so i was sure she was doing it every morning if she was doing it every morning that i was there and there was a particular little girl in the class and she had a way she would wear her hair and she would always be trying to fix her hair and so I had to tell her one day, her hair does not need to be fixed. But I think oftentimes, because we are not having these conversations with our kids at home, the children don't even understand that they are involved in a racially inappropriate situation. So a lot of times what happens is the kids, uh, they internalize it as something being wrong with them. And the adult is genuinely not trying to say that racially there's anything wrong with that child. They're just working from the perspective of, you know, what they know. And so that's why it's, it's just really important that we go to our kids' schools. I always tell parents that, like, even if you can't be at the school as a room parent and do it consistently once a week, like once a month, show up, show up with your, with your, at your kid's school because once you show up, you get to see the 
the intimacy is what I like to call it. The yeah. intimacy that happens in your kid's school. And then you can become an advocate because you can't become an advocate when you don't understand the issues. You you can, but you're not going to be a very effective advocate. So it it's, it's really is important that we go to our kids' schools and that we begin to understand, you know, what are the racial racial components that I need to buck up against, not only at the school, but at home. Because you know, a lot of times we give the schools more power than what they actually have. I'm a firm believer that as a parent, if you are really um, strategic and focused and firm in your belief system at home, your children will carry that into school, even if they're spending a majority of their time there, because you're their parent. I mean, most kids look upon their parents almost with no fault. So it's really easy for us to override these things if we, like you said, if we show up, show up to the school and acknowledge what's going on at the school and then also acknowledge what your role is at home. Right. So, yeah. So well, one, one, no, you go ahead. Okay. You so, yeah, I mean, I, I just want, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. One of the things that we found when we talked to parents and we, we, we specifically asked them, how do you engage your school? If you're in an urban school, your school might not be, you know, the ideal school. You're not in like Winchester Thurston or Shadyside Academy schools here in Pittsburgh. What are you doing strategically? And what they, what many of them said is, look, we're there. We're present. We know it's not optimal. We're in there building relationships with the teachers. We're in there building relationships with the principal. We're volunteering. I mean, this is contingent on having the time but we're there to make sure that we can navigate and that's what we call them navigators embedded navigators because they were there navigating their way through that system and they were there to be able to advocate for their child and men and in many instances that was you know racial and they had to address racial things you know when we talk about racial bias much of the racial bias that's out there it's not the Ku Klux Klan. It's not people with hoods coming to get you. A lot of it is people they don't even realize they're racist. When you look at the data and you look at implicit bias, which is the subconscious racism in society, 80% of white Americans have some anti-black implicit bias. These are infallible tests. Very convincing. I also point out, though, guess what? 40% of black Americans also have anti-black implicit bias. Yep. What does that mean for us? That means that society is bombarding us with negative messages and what we should think about not just black people, but brown people, other groups. And so it's very important that we are in schools advocating, building, building relationships because, it, you know, people are not necessarily trying, as you said, overtly trying to discriminate. But there may be an opportunity to educate. There may be an opportunity to, to build coalitions and to try to do the best thing for our children uh, in partnership with the schools, which many of our parents did. They saw themselves as partners in an imperfect system, trying to make it as, as, as good as they could. Absolutely. So when we talk about success, because I think that is – when you talk about tangibility of this study, when you talk about the tangibility of racial pride, um, we need to talk about what that looks like, you know, for kids who are being, who, who within their homes as well as in their schools are being instilled with racial pride, what, how do we measure that success? What does that success look like? Yeah, great question. Um, I think, I think, think of it on two levels. So, what is the product? What do we want them to look like when they got all this pride? What does that look like? We, we know that the, the kind of identity, the racial identity that is, is associated with strong achievement is a strong central like racial identity. My racial identity is important to me. Black children that feel that way tend to be higher achievers than black children that have either less of a racial identity or um, or identify with more mainstream kinds of, of ideas, and they're sort of more assimilating racially. A lot of people think, hey, let's be race neutral at home, and, and 
and downplay race as a factor in society. For black kids, we know that that's a negative predictor. That's not a good thing. You have to be real yes. about it. So, yes. Because the kids are really experiencing things. So what looks good and what really produces the result is kids that have a pretty strong centralized racial identity. What Now, one of the questions that has driven our research recently is that it's not 100% clear what the best approach is to producing or to teaching race pride is. It's like there, the previous research said, do you do it? Parents that do it have higher achieving children. Well, we started to ask what are the best ways to do it. And, and our work right now is showing that the best thing that you can do to instill racial pride in your children is anything that involves community. So are you a member of, you know, cultural groups? Are you in a faith community that has a racial cultural element to it? Hmm. Are you celebrating cultural holidays together? Are you listening to music together? Those are the activities that do a, do a strong job producing race pride. Surprisingly, it's not, you know, having your child necessarily do their book report on Benjamin Banneker. Well, they might learn a lot from that, but it's really your family reunion. It's these events that help them to build with other people in your race, positive members. Those are the things that really matter. When you talk about racial bias and helping kids be prepared for discrimination, we find that it's really important to validate their experiences, to acknowledge that, it, that it, it's happening but also balance keeping it real with encouragement. One mistake you can make is keeping it way too real that you discourage your kids and you think you bombard yes. them with all the ills of society, but you don't give them encouraging messages. And so one of the messages that is really important is racial resilience. We have a history of overcoming these challenges and you're going to be able to overcome and you're going to do it because that's who we are as a people. And that's like so interesting because I never thought about that, about the community aspect of it. So I'm going to definitely be trying better to implement that into um, to my life. But also, like you said, I think I think right now there is a wave that's going on in our community with and, and me and my girlfriend were actually talking about that last night, like with the whole movement of consciousness, how it's being overly pushed you know, all of these things that black people have been through. And it kind of creates almost like a, a number one, a numbing of the spirit because it's like, well, this just keeps happening. It's just horrible. It's happening over and over and over and over again without the also consistent messages of resilience and how we, you know, been resilient. And I found with my boys, even like when we were, studying, like I said, we were, we did a study last school year on, um, Toussaint and the strategies that he used to overcome. And his story is actually a really resilient story. It's sad at the end, but the story of how he overcame and how he basically went from just a regular slave to raising through the ranks of the army and then basically becoming like the king of Haiti for a time. And I think it's those, those stories of resilience that really help kids to realize, you know, we weren't just slaves or, you know, this, my legacy isn't a legacy of slavery. So that's really important. And, and that community aspect, like, yo, yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate that because yeah. that, that makes a lot of sense because if you really think about it in terms of historically, even though, you know, during the Jim Crow era and civil rights era, we were being attacked racially. We also had very, very, you know, whole communities and whole places where we could express our racial pride and racial identity without, you know, without being told that it wasn't important. And so that makes a lot of sense to why that would be, you know, important. Um, but I think that's, well, no, I need, that was, I was about to forget a question. So I know that in the Brown Mamas group, we had shared the survey a few times. Is the survey still open to be taken? And where is your research going now? Well, and how so can we help? The Brown Mamas have been so awesome to us that actually we fulfilled all of our survey needs. For oh, the that's moment. great. <laughs> so thank you to everybody who filled it out. But I will put it out there because it will open back up in the spring. And, um, okay. you know, basically the reason we know what might be some of the best strategies is because we ask people and people take time to fill out our survey. Um, and 
campaign and tell us about what they do with their children. And children can tip, then fill it out, and, and, I, and they got to be at least fifth grade, so it's mostly adolescents. And tell them what are the best experiences they have. And, you know, parents get $30 for filling it out. And it, it, it's not short. It takes about 30 minutes. But what I tell people is if you make $30 every 30 minutes, that's a six-figure six <laughs> salary. Okay. Right. <laughs> $60 an hour is a good salary. So, um, so you know, so in the spring that will open back up. And uh, we'll keep, we'll keep um, soliciting for that. What we're doing now is we're following people that have taken the survey over the next three years to see how their children are performing and what they're happened, what's happening um, with them over time. And that's the best way to really demonstrate the most uh, positive effects. And I, I should say all of our work is strength-based. We are only asking people about what they think are good practices. They're based on interviews we've had with black families, so this is a very strength-based survey. And we're partnering with schools and we're partnering with programs to share the work that we're finding. So if you want to learn more about it, you know, uh, look for us. We're on Facebook, uh, Parenting Project. Pit, uh, it's Pit Parenting on Facebook. It's Pit Parenting on Twitter. You can follow me, Hugh Lee Pitt, on Twitter, and we'll keep you updated on everything we're doing. And we'll make sure we post the um, link to that in the comments. So if anybody wants to go and follow up and see what they're doing and see how they can help, um, you can do that. So thank you everybody for tuning in. Thank you so much, Dr. J for coming and telling us about your, your study. Y'all know that's one of the issues that's near and dear to my heart. I truly believe that we need to begin to teach our children about our history. We need to be passionate about it. We need to show them we are just as passionate about our history as we are about learning about other cultures and ethnicities because there's just so much to teach. I mean, really, when you take a good look at our history, there, the vastness of it is, it's just ridiculous. There's so much there to choose from, from resilience to overcoming to, you know, trade and economics. I mean, there's just so much to teach. So we need to continue to do that. So thank you, Dr. J, for being a beacon for that. We appreciate you. We appreciate the time you, you, you've dedicated and just thank you for coming to talk to us because we know your time is important. Thank you, Muffy, for having me. Peace to all the brown mamas and my wife, Allison, who's watching is now one of the hey, brown Allison. mamas. Hey, Allison. And baby. Allison's in the brown mamas group, so, okay. you know, we can ask her questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can <laughs> and interrupt. And we can relate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jay. I'm okay. going to ask you out. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. All Good right. We'll talk to you later. See ya. Okay. Thank you everybody for tuning in to the Brown Mama Blueprint podcast. And I actually got it wrong last time. We I said we were going to be talking about self-care this week. No.